Welcome to Buy the Bywater, a podcast on the Megaphonic Network. I'm Ned Raggett. I'm Oriana Schwint. I'm Jared Pekachak. And we're here to talk about all things J.R.R. Tolkien. His work, his inspirations and impact, creative interpretations in other media, languages, lore, ripoffs, parodies, anything we think is interesting. Thanks for joining us. Hello and welcome to the 45th episode of By the Bywater. Great to be back with you. Final episode of 2022. We somehow got our way through this year. Ah, once, once again, once again, another year through. Yay. And all that. So we have stumbled our way through most of November. Thanksgiving's coming up. The big thing is Oriana has moved. She is now in yeah. Portland. An immediate recovery of mental health. Just immediate. <laughs> Deeply, deeply good to know. So, and uh, well, we are just we were... in time for the, uh, you know, the dark times. I know. So. <laughs> we, 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 the apartment was the walls were kind of a light grayish, uh, which is like a, a nice neutral color, but at the same time, it's Portland. So we uh, did some repainting of some of the apartment to like a cheerful yellow because you're gonna need that <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes it is, it is coming for you both soon meanwhile i'm down here in sf going da, 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 da. not that we don't get our no. own but yes it, well, it, it rains <laughs> so much there i like <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how it all works out so anyway so celebrate celebrate oriana never have to worry about uh upstairs neighbors or helicopters interrupting her recording again very very vital <sighs> very nice the look on her face. So <laughs> it could say it all. But we're all basically in deep breath mode, deep breath before the plunge, before the holidays, mm. eat our brain, <laughs> and things like that, one way or another. Um, but this is all a good thing. So, but we have our, I don't want to call it our light main topic to get to, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, lighter, let's say, although you know, we have thoughts. But uh, there is news, uh, some news. So please do take it away as always, Jared. <laughs> Just a few small updates here and there on some things to wrap up the year with. First off, the HarperCollins strike has gotten underway. The union has put out statements saying that they do not mind purchases to support authors during the strike and do specifically ask that purchases be made through independent bookstores rather than certain big conglomerates we all know about. Uh, you know, but they do ask that no reviews or publicity be done for releases during this time. With this in mind, feel free to purchase The Fall of Numenor at your leisure and via a good source, but we are holding off on any discussion of it until the strike is resolved. Some interesting news on the audiobook front too, Andy Serkis, having done his excellent readings of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, has recently revealed he will be doing a reading of The Silmarillion in the near future. Mm. It, yeah, it'll mm. be very interesting to hear what his vocal choices for any number of iconic characters will be. So once we have more word on this, we'll let you know for sure. And finally, a passing to note, Jules Bass, the thriving main partner of the Rankin Bass Animation Production House, has died at the age of 87. He and Arthur Rankin co-directed many of their projects, including, of course, their adaptations of The Hobbit and The Return of the King, as well as working on much of the lyrics of their productions so if you can't get the greatest adventure out of your head well that was the goal he was a yeah he was a key bridge figure between the days of walt disney and the animation booms of more recent decades and he'll be missed yep very true Aww. and yep, you can't get that out of your head oh no it is in my head i'm resisting now. it I, I i am building mental walls right now to keep it out <laughs> Hey, it's what lies ahead. Anyway, uh, <laughs> or you could sing the whip song. I mean, you know, whatever works. You okay, where's the, where there's a whip, there's a way. It does bang. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> It's good stuff there. I do think The Last Unicorn is a very interesting animation effort in particular. He co-directed that, unless I'm very wrong. So a chance to work on something not Tolkien for fantasy. And there are other things, too. And also for me, just in me, maybe me in particular, because it was so dominant back in the, you know, it was too too young for the 60s, but in the 70s, ranking best stuff everywhere in mm -hmm. terms of, like, holiday stuff. That and Peanut Specials, which, you know, probably explains a lot about me. <laughs> but, but, uh, but backing up a bit, yeah, Andy Serkis doing The Silmarillion. I'm, I am on board. I am so intrigued. I might actually buy an audiobook. I have I haven't I haven't bought the other two that he's done, but this this could get me to do that. He has very good variety, I would say, uh particularly in the Lord of the Rings uh reading that he did. Um I think I mentioned once before he doesn't seek to clone his fellow cast members. The closest mm -hmm. he gets is probably uh, Gandalf because there's a certain, you know, way of speaking Gandalf I think is kind of more or less consistent. So, but the variety he brought was very notable. In a way that didn't feel hmm, too show offy. So being mm -hmm. able to do things, especially where you're doing, like how do you give like the ultimate projection of evil a voice? You know how will you, how will you handle Morgoth? How will you handle the dialogue between Morgoth and Angoliant? I mean that's just one example. <laughs> I mean that's going to be interesting. Baron and 
Luthien. I mean, there's a lot going on. I think uh, I think it'll be very interesting to see what he comes up with, and I'm certainly looking forward to that. And yes, the news on the uh, strikes support it, but uh, the union has said, yeah, then we can go ahead and buy, but not necessarily talk <laughs> about it. So, and that's that's more than fair. Although, if you're you know wanting to, you know, you can view this either way. The idea is to try and make sure money keeps going to authors. Whereas I think uh, I didn't really include this in news, but Forbes I think ranked the estate as something like earning five hundred million dollars last year. Due to they're not, they're not hurting for cash. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, you can buy it secondhand, things like right. that. So, so we will see. But yes, we will factor that in. And uh, yeah, that that was the most recent update. Literally was the other day, and they are still on strike. And that may feed into where the next episode after this one will go, but we'll get to that. So otherwise, uh, yes, things just sort of up in the air. There were some vaguely related uh, Rings of Power news stories, but we're ignoring those because there's nothing really to say. No. I'm not going to ignore it for a second because I do think it is really interesting that it just kind of sank. Mm. Yeah. Like, yeah. I follow a lot of people who are big Tolkien fans who liked the show, and I'm still seeing like maybe one gift set a week about it, whereas House of the Dragon or something it's has still like going. it's still yeah they're mm. still still talking about people it. People still it's talking like, about it. Yeah, and I know part of that is probably just like maybe I don't follow people who liked it enough to keep talking about it, but also the conversation has moved on from it. So yeah. completely, yeah, it's no. not what Amazon wanted it to be, and I'm kind of grateful for that. <laughs> no memes at all. I've I've seen no memes. I've seen one meme. That's crazy. That is it. A billion, you know, or seven hundred and fifty million dollars and one meme. You should be spitting memes out by the yeah. like House of the Dragon generated. <laughs> yeah, by the bucket load. And as we, as I mentioned, at the end of the last episode too, I was talking about how great Andor was. I mean, Andor is now like becoming a cultural conversation point amid. You know, you have I've seen more than one take it like it's almost too good for Star Wars. I mean, you know, that's actually you know <laughs> yeah. just you know everyone and with the final episode coming up this week, uh, right before Thanksgiving, and then as I mentioned, the Willow series is about to hit next week. <gasps> Things moved on. I've heard, said, good, so. I've heard also good – like I know we were excited just from the trailer because it looked mm-hmm. fun and, and cool and good. But reviews are saying – you know, certain people I know who have seen screeners are like, oh, yeah, this is like a – this is a really good time. So – that's exciting. All right. Yeah, we'll we'll probably have thoughts about this when we come back for our next episode, which won't be, of course, until the new year when we start to see some more of that. A random comment here or two. But we have, uh, well, we have uh, something else to talk about. And uh, and it's sort of like, you know, you've, you've waited a year since our last one. You know, we've been dropping trailers, building up the excitement. You know, we're trying to take you back to 2002 in 2022. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. So, Jared, please, as our point person, take it away from the main topic. I was thinking about how to like introduce this and it's like I it's 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 two towers. Like if right? you <laughs> if you're seeing it, you've seen mm. Fellowship of the Ring, how much introduction does it need? I mean, we started the conversation last time talking about what our experiences were leading up to Fellowship of the Ring and I'm still I still kind of want to lead with that because mm-hmm. I remember, you know, going to see or not going to see, like watching Fellowship of the Ring at home on a tiny little like cathode ray tube TV with like dials on it. We had a really old TV. We had one of those mm. too. Yeah, was, you know, poor people. So that was not the most cinematic experience. But the two towers, you know, saw that and was like, oh, oh, God, how are they going to handle like the Ents? What what is Helm's Deep going to look like? Which, I mean, in retrospect, is something I was not actually thinking about because <laughs> it's not a major part of the book. Right, right. Mm-hmm. But things like that, things like the Balrog fight, things like all of these things. How are they going to do that? Because we saw what they did with Pleasure of the Ring. They really nailed it. What are they going to do? Oh, how how good is this going to be? It's going to be awesome, right? Like checking, you know, Lord of the Rings dot net every day again. Like, oh, I, oh, here's more concept art. Oh God, you know, getting winding myself up for this thing and getting so excited. And then, and then it was such a big deal when it came out because I was actually able to see it in the theaters. I earned money by coloring. By coloring? <laughs> no, no, no. You, so if you go to apparently, if you go to Disney World I've, or Disneyland, I've never been, but you know mm-hmm. the characters can sign things for you, mm-hmm. like autograph things mm-hmm. as Minnie Mouse or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I somebody gave me a bunch of those to like color. Oh, oh! And, and I did that and earned like enough money for a movie ticket. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> And then got there too late, sat in the front row, so I was you know, oh, neck no. cream back the whole <laughs> time. I walked hours. out in pain. Oh, God. And it was the most amazing experience of my life. 
of course. up until that point when you know these these swooping helicopter shots oh of mountains and like mm-hmm. the echoes of the previous movie and i was like shivers running all over my tiny little body <laughs> like oh this is so cool this is so cool this is so cool and then got out and was like this is the best thing that's ever happened to me and then re-watching it this past week or two i was like actually this movie kind of sucks <laughs> <laughs> Like, I haven't, I've watched it less than I've watched Fellowship of the Ring yes. and Return of the King. And I just thought, well, maybe because I don't feel like watching Helm's Deep for three hours. <laughs> but then I, really paying attention to it this time and going, you know, this really isn't, mm-hmm. it has it has a lot of good stuff. Yes. But it's really, my, my thesis for this episode is The Two Towers, Breaking News, is not actually a good movie. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hold that thought. Ariana, what yeah. was your first experience of watching it like? What was your buildup? So the buildup was actually, this. it was very important to me because, so my family had lived in a one-story house my whole life, basically. When I was 15 in September of that year, we moved to a house that had one room on a second story, and the stairs were kind of steep. Within two weeks of moving into that house, I fell down the stairs and broke both feet at the same time. No! Actually, I broke both feet while falling. Um, (laughs) And so I was in a wheelchair for six weeks. uh, And (laughs) so the two towers came out the day after I got out of my walking cast. Like, you know, I, I finally, like... Everything had finally healed Mm -hmm. and it had ruined my swimming season. I wasn't able to like go to state or anything. I had to go to homecoming in a wheelchair. Uh, (laughs) uh, And so I finally was free and was able to sort of walk properly again. And so this was like the first big, the thing that I did, this was like sort of my reward for suffering through. I loved it, but also at the same time, I was really mad about a lot of stuff. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> at the same time. But my feelings then were as a like snotty little book purist. Like mm, yeah. that was oh, my mm-hmm. now that it's Relatable. literally twenty <laughs> years later, I can look back and go like I was kind of right, but for the wrong reasons. Mm-hmm. 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 My feelings were valid that this is like not correct, but it not because it's not true to the book or whatever. It been because it's, you know, not like literally uh directly direct transcribing of what happened into Mm -hmm. images but there are lots of like really weak storytelling choices in this film Mm -hmm. and some of that is just because it has to be a bridge and some of that is just because they they had like studio interference basically a lot of it feels like studio interference and we'll we'll definitely get to questions sure about will. that. I, I sure have some, and you know, not everything's been told. I should have done some rereading of some of the unofficial making of books, which mm-hmm. have some insight into that. Um, they're out there. The Frodo franchise is good. I need to read that again. But setting that aside, my own experience. So again, unlike my uh, younger co-host, I was a fully functioning adult at this point. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, so so for me, it was more a matter of all right, let's do this. So the so for me, the run up was. I mean, you know, I had, I mean. I had seen Fellowship, what, eight times in theaters? I can't remember. It was something, like, absurd. But I had absolutely no problem with that. The last time of which was the one that had the extended footage trailer at the very end. Not the formal trailers that were released, but the separate just for the uh, theatrical showing that debuted some of the Two Towers footage. And Mm -hmm. uh, and that was fantastic because uh, just being able to uh, just being able to see that, and they're like, ah. And I still remember some people around me in the theater when I was like, oh, Gandalf's going to come back. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You fool. You didn't know. <laughs> how dare! How dare! How dare they did not know. Um, yeah. So uh, the the run up of images started being released, and so I was you know again like you know so many of us tracking on the One Ring Net, learning yeah. about the reshoots, mm-hmm. you know building it up. Trailers get released. It's like okay, here it goes. There was I remember one very effective trailer of the two main ones that released that the soundtrack was half the Howard Shore music. Now that they had some to work with, and then half uh, the music it was Clint Mansell's uh, soundtrack for Requiem for a yes. Dream. Yeah. Oh, oh my I god. That. Oh my I god. I love that, that music for that. I like It was such a good <laughs> Oh my very god, I good lost choice. my mind. I lost my mind. I like Kazad that song. <laughs> <laughs> Kazad it. Wow. Yeah. Boy, internet yeah. memory is a wonderful thing, isn't it? 
<laughs> Boy, that is fantastic. So, but uh, yeah, we'll obviously throw a link to that in the show notes. Again, a very distinct trailer, a very, very good choice. And I could talk more about Clint Mansell and his musical background because it's so wonderfully weird how he went from where he what came from that. But that's a long story. That's, that's my that's music another side. podcast. <laughs> yeah, don't set that one inside. So in any event, the run-up was now the important thing for me viewing this one, again, fully functioning adult, sorry, was that uh... I could make the call to go on my own in midnight. And I did. Although it wasn't on my own. It was myself and my friend. I have two good friends named Misty. Totally different people. Still, <laughs> still, still friends. So this is one of them. And uh, she and I went. And uh, I remember we got in there. And this was, this was, of course, the days before you could buy your tickets for your seats. You yes, could buy tickets, right. but you couldn't, you know. Mm-hmm. It is, and by the time we got it together, it was like near the end. Now, we were not like Jared. We were not stuck up front. I remember my own up front going, the screen experience when I was a kid seeing Empire Strikes Back for the first oh. time. Oh, wow. that was a good crick in my neck thing. But uh, I was nine, and I still loved every minute of it. Yeah, uh, no, it's, it's, that's a great front row oh movie. Oh, I, I have no complaints, but again, another podcast. So, um, <laughs> so in any event, for this one, we were, we were in the center, but we were all the way off to the side, which was fine because it was the big Newport screen that I think I mentioned before down in Orange County. So, you know, no real bad seat in the house unless you're crazy up front. <laughs> and uh, and I just remember, and I still think this, that the movie the, the movie is very interesting. Now we can sort of turn getting into that first experience of it because uh, you were sort of hinting at this, Jared. Um, it's the most self-consciously epic beginning of the yeah. of yeah. the three movies because the first one of course begins with the very quiet just the forging of the rings and the third one famously begins with just as one of the co-editors said one little worm <laughs> whereas, this, uh, <laughs> whereas the second one is this you know <laughs> you know it, the Howard Shore's music goes great with it as a wonderfully understated counterpart although you could just as easily throw Wagner on top of it and be like oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, has that, it has that you know swooping around the mountains and as Jared noted that really weird feeling I remember a guy going like Ugh, when I started hearing like did I hear voices? Are those mm-hmm. voices? Uh, wait, was that from the first film? And of course it was. Just that little echoing candle. Yeah. And I mm-hmm. thought that was a very effective way to to bury it in. It was sort of, and a credit to Jackson for this, who I think he and he and, Wal- and Walsh and Boyens mentioned this in their commentary, that they wanted to have a sort of James Bond style opening where you have a mini adventure kicking in uh, right at the start of it, which you <laughs> essentially get. And it's a nice little film trick. It's obviously not separate from the story, but, uh, yeah. and it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not the first thing you see uh, or uh, or before the titles it comes after the titles um, but uh, but I it's a very effective way it's a good sort of way that uh, again keeping in mind what Jackson said he was aiming for rightly uh, he was aiming for as he put it uh, the people who had seen the film once a year before yeah. and mm-hmm. hadn't seen it again yeah we choose right to look at that point of view. I mean, that describes my dad. That yes. describes my sister. That's exactly how they viewed it. You know, my mom and I were the ones going, ah. <laughs> my, my, right. my sister and my dad were more like, you know, and they were all watching it again for Christmas, and I had seen it again a couple of times before that, but same deal. And I thought that's a very effective way. It's like, here's Gandalf again. Oh, okay, you saw him fall. Here's what happens after he fell, seemingly, although it wakes up just a dream, and boom, we're back at that. Okay, so stopping there, because, you know, let's throw it open. I agree with Jared Noriano watching this again uh, and this was the theatrical version uh, digging up I dug out the old DVD and it was going like hey remember this DVD menu and Jared was like oh my god <laughs> <laughs> the sense memory just like right back in that crappy little house we lived in at the time just like sitting on the floor yeah. Looking at the DVD menu. <laughs> oh, yeah. And this was, remember, again, folks, you know, everyone's so used to the extended editions, the theatrical cut, which yes. is, you know, its own thing, and which is how we all first saw it. And it's important to view it through that lens because mm-hmm. that's, you know, that's how, you know, the, yes, the, the extended has things. But anyway, the thing about it is, is that, yeah, watching it individually, watching it on its own, as opposed to watching it, which I have, which I admittedly haven't done in a long time, but, you know, barreling through all three of them and just simply letting right. it roll ride, you know, and all that, it, it basically, Basically, there's a lot going on and there's much positive we'll talk about. But yeah, my, my overwhelming feeling coming off this watching it again was sort of like, this film is choppy. Yeah. It's really yeah. choppy. It is very choppy. It has very good vignettes. It has other mm, vignettes. Mm-hmm. And it it's, it, as Oriana was saying, it it, it sags. <laughs> you know, yeah. it sags on many levels. It was... Man. Yeah, it's so saggy. It was very interesting watching it. On the on the heels of Rings of Power and going, mm. this is where they're getting half of the crap yes. that they pulled there. Yes. Where it's like making up a bunch of stuff that doesn't advance the narrative, like Aragorn falling off a cliff and they're like, oh no, he's dead. And it's like that's 
that doesn't add anything to the story because yeah, it doesn't. What are we learning here? Yeah, it, we're not learning anything. And people who read the book know he's going to come back, so it's not a thing for them. But also, like because they're adapting a book where that never happens, it mm. can't affect the narrative yes. at all, and it doesn't. So it's this just this weird little dead end that happens for no real reason. And there's a lot of stuff like that where it's like it's cool for a moment. <laughs> But it doesn't matter as a building block of the narrative. And there's just, there's a lot like that. Like Arwen and Elrond being having this weird conversation. Like that whole like that's a whole issue on its own. Or like half the stuff with the ends feels like a vignette when it really shouldn't. Or there's mm-hmm. all these things that are just kind of happening mm-hmm. that because they aren't part of the book can't advance the narrative. Yeah. They're not necessarily bad in themselves some of the time, but they're also like, you could have replaced this with something that matters. Like the mm. I know mean, we're not talking about the extended edition exactly, but there's the stuff in the extended edition about mm-hmm. right. Boromir and Faramir and their relationship and how that affects Faramir's inferiority complex, yeah. which he has in the movie and doesn't have in the book. Mm-hmm. What, but, you know, if they're going to do that for the movie, do, commit to it and mm-hmm. give put that in the movie instead of Aragorn, like his horse girl adventure. Like, why? <laughs> <laughs> there are all these choices that just don't matter. Yeah. And it's. That reverberates through Return of the King as well when we get to that. Mm-hmm. Now it's in Rings of Power because they learned the wrong lessons from the Two yep. Towers, which is actually you can do this. <laughs> <laughs> there is a lot of like, you know, my feeling is that you could take 45 minutes out of the theatrical cut you and really not could. miss any of it. What I feel suffers the most in this movie, um, the characters that suffer the most are actually Merry and Pippin. Um, yeah, I think that that their storyline is is done the most disservice, uh, other than turning Gimli like fully into only comic relief. God, I hate. <sighs> I like. I feel like I was not as down on that until I met you, Jared. <laughs> and now, <laughs> truth will truth will out. <laughs> I totally am like, yes, it actually does kind of suck that they did that to him. So hmm. maybe like the Gimli changes are, are on par with Mary and Pippin being kind of exiled. Like they don't really get anything to do here. I was watching it with with my husband, who like you know has read Lord of the Rings maybe once. Big fan. Of the movies he was i was talking about like ah oh, man like this mary pippin stuff like he was like well do they really do much and i was like well i guess it's not really that much more in the book but it but you do stay with them and hang out with them more and there's some of the mm-hmm. most beautiful passages in like the whole mm-hmm. work yeah is is from this storyline uh yeah. and it feels like they just don't get to do any of that and instead you get this Arwen and Elrond stuff that the core of which is not actually terrible. I like, no. you know, I find the idea of a woman having to decide, like, do I marry this man who is kind of like a, it's like a dog almost that you're taking <laughs> care of? <laughs> uh, you know, I know his life is going to be shorter than mine, and mm-hmm. I'm going to miss him so much when he's gone, and then I have to... Or do I go to paradise and and carry that love with me? Like, that actually is a compelling story, but it is not set up in the previous film. Yeah. Arwen is not sufficiently set up as a main character herself in the previous film. And so here it's just like, why? Why is this happening? What yeah. are we doing? Yeah. I do want to get back to Arwen in a second, but I also, before Mary I forget, want right. to get Mary and Pippin out of the way. <laughs> get them out of the way. Um, <laughs> like the film does. Part, right? <laughs> well, so part of, you know, in a weird way, they actually, I feel like they get more to do in the movie. The problem yes. is, that it, is that it sucks. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> right. Because so we were talking in the episode about Fellowship of the Ring about how Jackson's Middle Earth is a lot more fraught and paranoid mm-hmm. and dangerous than like canon Middle Earth. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that means that works in the first movie where it's like we got to get off on the adventure and mm-hmm. all that. But in the mm-hmm. second movie where everybody now has to be convinced to take an action that will benefit them. Good way to phrase it. Yeah. Doesn't make any. It doesn't make sense now. Right. Like in the in the book, the Ents are kind of paralyzed over what to do about mm-hmm. Saruman. 
Mm-hmm. They're 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 building up to anger. They haven't gotten there yet, and Mary and right. Pippin arrive and are like that. Like the, the little the straw that breaks the camel's back. Like Gandalf yeah. compares them to what like a little rock that starts an avalanche, that yeah. kind of thing. So the they catalyst. do a lot. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. they do a lot yeah. less. But by being there, they provide an outside perspective and make the Ents realize that something big is going on. They can fix something. They can take action. They and then they do. But in the movie, they're like, no, actually, we're somehow unaware that half of Fangorn is missing now, and we don't right. want to do anything about it until we actually see it and it's like how are you this bad at your job how are you this <laughs> stupid they're stupid in the movie and in the book they're just they're smart they just haven't taken action yet right right so yeah. it, it makes mary and pippin feel extraneous not extraneous but they're like their their moments with the ents are so silly because they're like actually you should take us south because no, of duh, stupid yeah. reasons and, and <laughs> it's like everybody in this storyline now comes across as a lot sillier than they really should when there's no it's it's just really it's a really bizarre choice why mm-hmm. would they have to be convinced of this when they're much more paranoid than they are in the book it feels like why would why is this happening why why is why are the screener screener so convinced that nobody could possibly ever want to do anything about what's hurting them <laughs> unless mm-hmm. somebody else like gives them a rousing speech why is that happening like this happens in rohan this happens mm-hmm. other places that i'm suddenly mm-hmm. forgetting but it's all over <laughs> this movie and it's really annoying <laughs> Right, right. The yeah, turning turning Treebeard into a dummy, frankly, mm, yeah, no, it, it's one of those things. I just remember at the time going like, man, mm-mm. and as time has gone on, it's one of those things that yeah, you know, he, the we don't get, and I understand why we don't get them, you know, but we don't get those. It's, it's, I wouldn't necessarily call them fully lyrical scenes, but very, very interesting focus scenes. Like basically when they go to Welling Hall yeah. and they just have the you know the conversations, the steady ones, and sort of like you know in, in talking with Treebeard, Treebeard sort of like builds to his point of sort of like okay, you know something should probably happen. Let's start. Yeah. Let's, let's get this ball rolling. But even the details about like you know Treebeard standing up in in you know t- taking in the rain or right. yeah. description oh, that's hall, such you a know, beautiful. Yeah. Moment. yeah, we you know again, and this I guess is one of those things. You can't have everything. What do you leave out? But it's a real pity we don't really get that. Even the extended version where they do the bit where, you know, they uh, have the end drafts and grow a little bit. And we have the old man will of transposition. Part. Yeah, mm. which is kind of weird. But again, not <laughs> theatrical. So, you know, by, by not even having that, it basically just sort of seems like all, you know, aside from like, you know, little, rest little shirelings and putting them on the ground, which was kind of a cute moment. That yeah. mostly it's just simply just walking around and just, you know, being bored by Treebeard, which is not yeah. what. That's not what happened. Yeah, they find him fascinating. Yeah. They find like end boot boring, but they find Treebeard fascinating. Yeah. And it also raises logistical issues. Like Treebeard is able to summon the ends at the last possible second for no re- like they're just yeah. there. Why are they there? Like that's that's gonna be world all lurking somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Why is that it just it it hurts more than it solves to have these characters be written this way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like I get that you it's hard to convey that mood of simmering rage that's all over the book. Right. I know that it's, it's a little difficult, especially in a movie that's trying to move as quickly as this. Mm-hmm. But it, it, like, why? Yeah, I also <laughs> you don't have to do it like this. Yeah, I really miss the horns too. Yeah, yeah. And I find like that. And it's like a it's like a five second shot in the extended where you could just convey that they are there. Like, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And mm-hmm. and it is like you know Jackson and it's unfortunate that the Shelob stuff comes in Return of the King, uh, but that right. stuff is like the, you know Jackson is good at the horror elements of mm-hmm. of these books, and so it's kind of a bummer because scary moving trees is very like oh my god a, a forest that hates you and can move mm-hmm. is terrifying, and I really wish that we could have seen more of that uh, again in. Instead of yeah. Borgs attacking and Gimli falling off <laughs> a horse, such a and oh silly my, thing. and all of the build up to Helm's Deep really irritated me. Yeah, this this go round Helm's Deep. I I feel like this is a thing, like a whole topic on its own in a way. But like mm-hmm. how Helm's Deep is handled in this movie is that it's the centerpiece of the yes. story, right? Mm-hmm. And it, in the book, it's like a chapter. Yep. There's like a chapter of them deciding what to do. There's a chapter where they end up there, like that. That's one chapter, and mm-hmm. then they're there, and it's, there's a battle, and then the aftermath is another chapter, and then we're off to, like, like the the, Pal- the Palantir stuff, and then we're off to Frodo and Sam and Shelob and all that. But it's it's not as big a thing. I get that they probably wanted to have a big epic battle, and this they is the only that. one that, yeah, that, was th- this the is the studio, only one that would work. Obviously. But there's, there's so much of it. There's so, <laughs> there so much. There is so much of it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It got. I remember in the theater, I was like, "Oh, this is overwhelming. I love it. Like, keep going." Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But watching it 
any other time out of that theater has been like, are we done yet? <laughs> Can Why we is move? this still going? Yeah, it just yeah. goes on and on and on. And the, like the amount of work that went into that is mm-hmm. like... It's a, it's yeah. a good battle sequence in yes. its own, but it yeah. takes but... up so much space in this movie. And they, it is... I will complain to the end of my days about the elves showing up here. That is so stupid. It's, it, 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 like, even, How do you really feel? Again, not even from a, a, a fidelity to the source material perspective. Right. Mm-hmm. From mm-hmm. a narrative tension standpoint, like all we've heard are how amazing the elves are. Like having them come to, like it just immediately reduces the tension. You're also mm-hmm. like, why? What, wait, How what did do you they mean? get here? How did they get here? How did they even know this was happening? Really? Mm-hmm. I know that they, like, Galadriel can see and There's blah, the blah, whole blah, te- telepathic. It still doesn't feel like enough. And, again, like, how did they get here so quickly? Because mm-hmm. uh, Lothlorien is pretty far away. Yeah. I know, <laughs> like, even Legolas can't run, you know, that distance. It took distance. them three days to get, like, halfway across Rohan. Yeah, I mean, the, the, in the beginning of the book, it takes Aragorn and Legolas like three yep. days just to get anywhere close to. Exactly, Thang- and they're like, and they're booking it. Know. They're yeah. traveling light and booking it. So, and it, a whole bunch of elves in full armor are able to get from Lothlorien to Helm's Deep, which is much further. It it makes no sense. It, it, like nothing. Why would they help the Rohirrim instead of Gondor? That like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a good... That hadn't even occurred to me. Oh, yeah. You're so right. Why are they there instead of... Yeah, they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> They're there for reasons. If they cared about Rohan, the Rohirrim wouldn't be suspicious of Lothlorien this exactly. whole time, right? Like, <laughs> if, the, if there were any... And, like, I know that uh, the initial... You know, Arwen was supposed to be leading. Right. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. And that... I kind of like... It would make a little more sense. Yeah, because she they they have her as kind of like a like a she's she get in stuff done in the first movie. It makes kind it, I don't love it, but I, I kind yeah, of like I don't it. Like it as but, like, but like it's... maybe she hears Aragorn is there, like he's heading to Helm's Deep, and she somehow gets there. I don't know. It doesn't still doesn't make logistical no, sense. But emotional sense. It makes a little more emotional sense. And then and if what, it's a what, smaller it, like, group of elves too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But what was it? Didn't something like it leaked and the audience, the fans were so mad about it that they changed it and then put in this other craft so that Liv Tyler could still fulfill her contract or something. Yeah, <laughs> something no, like it's... that. Yeah, I can't believe they like they shot it. They they shot it. And there's mm-hmm. so many shots that you can see. Like once you know that that's what happened, uh, mm-hmm. you can see like, oh, wow, they really had to make Haldir really important. This elf that <laughs> like, absolutely all of a sudden, really... <laughs> no one cared about. <laughs> yeah, like Aragorn's suddenly like, oh, oh we're, they're besties. We're, we're besties. <laughs> what? Why? Uh, yeah. the, 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 uh, among the many moments, I'll bring up a couple of the things. There, there, there are many things about the film. I have always essentially rolled with, meaning it's sort of mm-hmm. like, okay, you made this choice. I don't dislike this choice, but I'll be fine, you know. And <laughs> uh, we haven't even talked about half of them yet. Um, but uh, you know, just sort of like things like, uh, okay, I'll just be like, you know, I'll save it for a moment like this. But there's been a moment in the film that I have always, always, ever since I first saw it in the theater, thought, get out. <laughs> it was, it was when the elves having arrived. And they're waiting for mm-hmm. the uh, uh, for for the orcs to show up and all that for the orc guy to make their appearance is that you know Aragorn proceeds to walk up and down the elf lines and give them all a pep talk. Yeah, mm-hmm. about how uh, you know, don't show any mercy and all that. And I'm thinking to myself, okay. You're talking to a bunch of immortal beings right. who have been they dealing with this thing now for centuries, if not millennia. <laughs> who are you, Pipsqueak? Get out of here! Like, the these only... people have probably fought in the end of the First Age, or yeah. at least yeah, I the mean, last the, the reason like... why it's done is obviously, you know, it builds up this idea of, you know, Aragorn as ultimate authority figure, which is its own loaded issue. But this is a yeah. classic example of how the impulse of what they're trying to do in the film, and the sheer utter logic of what the Tolkien's created world completely collide and it doesn't work there is no way this scene should exist Mm -hmm. and it's so annoying it's one of those things like you yeah you broke me you lost me does not work i mean part of that part of that speech i think does really work which is that aragorn is telling them what the weak points are which is something they wouldn't know because the urukai are a new creation I think yeah. Legolas says that, though. Oh, one of them. D- oh, I thought it was Aragorn. Ugh. Yeah, I think Legolas, Legolas, when they're doing the words, he sort of says to his fellow elves. Oh, yes. Yes. I totally thought the, Aragorn yes. said that. Mm-hmm. Never mind. Never mind. No, no, Aragorn's just giving the pep talk. Okay, yeah, that's that's completely silly then. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> it is. It's yeah. And when you see them in their beautiful golden armor and you're like, mm-hmm. how could anyone? Well, and then like they disappear, like no one ever talks again about this force of elves. Where do they yeah. go? What I do think they, they all, I think the implication is they all die. Yeah, yeah, it seems to be the case, yeah. That also sucks deeply because they wouldn't all die and also uh, I, the, the. <laughs> I mean, Yeah, it, it's another moment that kind of just can't be followed up on because it doesn't happen. Right. You would have to have like a, I don't know other scenes where they talk about this or something, and yeah. it's like you, you just can't do that and have it still be the story that you're trying to tell. Mm-mm. Uh, yeah. Building back a bit about it, you know, uh, let's argue. Let's argue about the scene in. Let's argue about the whole sequence in general for what Jackson's stated goals were. He was trying to do. Yes, it was definitely something that was key. In fact, there's important to remember that in the uh, original pitch to the studios to Hollywood, saying, "Hey, someone take this." He had already sunk in. There's a bit of him basically sure, sure ground that the huge mock-up of Helm's Deep they had already created, mm-hmm. basically saying, "No, they've already they, he already knew this was going to be a key central thing he wanted to work on and mm-hmm. put in the film." This was one of those things that was sort of like you know, and this was back in like '97, mm-hmm. and he had already had this huge thing done. I mean, as part of pre-production. I mean, it's sort of like it was clearly something that he really wanted to have a hand in, and he has mentioned and again, this is in the commentaries and this also fits in the explanation why the elves are there uh, is the idea that uh, his reference point and you can read into all sorts of things about this, given the choice of film, and I think you probably should, is the fact that he was referencing the uh, 1960s uh, British film Zulu, uh, which oh. is, oh. which you know, he he's very much specifically talked about this. Now, there's Zulu, and then there's this other film, Zulu Dawn. Zulu Dawn is, to my mind, the much more interesting film, because it's about the British losing. <laughs> <laughs> and that was done, that was done uh, about 15 years later, it should be noted. Zulu itself is about the British having lost this one outpost that held out against the Zulu. Ooh. Ah. Oh, that's so loaded. Ah. And so his he was coming from it from the viewpoint he was saying that the elves are there because there's an equivalent bit, and I've only seen Zulu once, maybe twice in all my years. It's a fine Michael Caine performance, fine. Again, given the overall, mm, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> is, is the fact that the idea that this highly, that this deeply outnumbered British outpost um, was got a last minute bit of reinforcements that they were just able to hold off off, etc. Everything there from the uh, ravening hordes. Oh wow! So, I really cool. hate that a lot. I hate that, that so much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you, you should hate it, frankly. It's one of those oh things God. where it, it, it is a very skillfully done film for what it is. It is a very post World War II. Ah, the British stiff over lip. We'll see it all through and everything like that. Build uh-huh. drawing on imperial legacies and other things like that. You should uh-huh. look at that askance. Mm-hmm. You should keep that in mind when you consider how this particular battle has been set up. It's one of those things that makes you go. Mm. Yeah, and, especially you know, given I'm, what how the Urukai look in this. Yeah. Oh no! I do want to. I I feel like Ned is heading somewhere with Helm's Deep, but I also want to <laughs> pin like let's talk about orcs a little later and how yeah. they're treated in this movie because yeah, yeah, it's yeah, very yeah, different sure, from yeah. the book. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Anyway, go on with your. <laughs> oh well, uh, yeah. I mean, the the thing about it is, having said that, in a weird way, he is successful using his inspiration because, again. You know, if you if you can't unpin, you can't uh, remove all this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. the but the original film does certainly have some sterling moments in terms of okay, you know, you've created your tensions, etc., whatever things like that. You know, again, try divorce and have you look at it. Um, <laughs> similarly, I mean, there are you know, for all that it is, I get a very dare too long moments like the tense realization that yep, they only have you know old men and kids around to support mm-hmm. them. Uh, mm-hmm. The uh, the moment where everything sort of pulls away, it's very very quiet. And everyone's on the mm-hmm. battlements and they're looking at something. You don't quite know what they're looking at yet, but you hear something in the distance. And then you get the reverse shot looking out over the battlements through the elves and you see just nothing but, but, but this wave of torches coming. Yeah. And it's like, and then you're moving up. And then there was the bit which was featured heavily in the trailer where, you know, everyone, where all the or- the, or- the entire orc army yeah. is just chanting and stamping and other things. And it's one of those things that's sort of like, as a friend of mine said at the time, it's like, I don't think I've ever seen a scene like this in movies being able to perish out so well because it's, yeah, I mean, it, 
calls back to like you know you know cast of thousands type stuff from big 50s 60s things but uh you yeah. know this is something where it's you know it's it's much more precise and kind of overwhelming and very well done it's like mm-hmm. uh, you know and and what is there are those little moments of tension you know the endlessly memed so it begins mm-hmm. and uh, and my one and my other favorite moment of actually wordless acting in the entire sequence is uh and we should I, here's my pivot that i'm going to do after this so we need to talk about them is uh when bernard hill realizes oh that that the explosion has happened has taken out things and his look is someone who literally cannot imagine what in the world he's seen because mm, it is yeah. so utterly yeah. unique unusual it's possibly even stronger than it is in the book in the book it's sort of like a blow it's like ah they've lit the fire we're gonna let's fight this one's more sort of like everyone's in shock and he's literally yeah. in shock like i cannot believe what i am seeing i had no idea this is even possible or even exists what the hell just happened yeah so that's mm-hmm. i think very vivid but let me use that as a pivot now so let's back up a bit in the film and let's talk about characters in a little more detail uh that we are all introduced to let's talk rowan let's talk edoras let's talk theoden mm. aomer aowen and Wormtongue. let's talk these four and because these are a big batch of new character introductions, mm-hmm. essentially, mm-hmm. one or two important exceptions aside. And from my point of view, I think everyone agrees that Edoras as a piece of set design and construction. Oh, my God. God. Uh, phenomenal. My absolutely God. phenomenal. Everything that they did to prepare for that, the work shows on the screen, ridiculously well done. I mean, credit to everybody involved, all the way down from they discovered it, to what they're planning, the whole thing. They set it up there. They do the filming there. The wind's whipping around the whole yeah. Oh, my God. Astoundingly well done. I mean, it just, on that creative level alone, the the Edera sequences, just for the sheer beauty of being filmed where they were, how it was done, how mm-hmm. everything, how everyone looked. Uh, I, 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 again, I, I don't have the words. It's <laughs> yeah. it's it's mm-hmm. something that, you know, as we move into even more fully into a world of like where everything seemingly is created by CGI to one extent or another, you know, yep. even Jackson, of course, fell prey to that so much with the <sighs> Hobbit. <laughs> seeing, seeing that they did this is just like, yeah. you know, I mean, you know, the that, power of having something real to yeah. walk around in yeah. and right. film and just, you know, be able to point the camera literally anywhere and you'll get a good shot. I mean, yeah. exactly. just, it's astounding. It, it's almost yeah. the best character you could say in the film. It's 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 it. it yeah, I, I could go on and yeah. that's how it is. No, so, fantastic. So, so with that said, let's now drill down into everybody. So let's let's talk about casting choices. Now, here's my big regret. I think Carl Urban is very, very charismatic as Amor, but we don't really get him. We don't get the book's Amor. I and that always, pisses me off. I always, like, because Carl Urban is so charismatic and perfect in, in this mm-hmm. role, I always forget that he's actually not in this movie that much. No, he yeah. isn't. He gets, like, two scenes, really. It's, it's like... crazy, because I definitely, like, remember watching this in the theaters and being like, I love him. <laughs> Everybody had that oh moment my... in the theater. Right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And yet he's barely in it. Although I will say, like, everyone is very perfectly cast. The introduction to the to Rohan that we get, which is very early on in the movie, mm-hmm. is ruinously effective. It's not even mm-hmm, our main mm-hmm. people. It's just right. the, the village being attacked and the children yeah. and the girl saying, Mama! Like yeah. it just ruins yeah. me every every time. Kudos, kudos to them for doing that. It's so good. Miranda Otto is great. I think like she yeah. has this fragility and strength at the same time. It's really really impressive. She nails it. <laughs> like and Bernard Hill, like my man, yeah. my man. <laughs> like he just Ned that moment that you're talking about with Theoden. I have so many issues with Theoden as written, but. Bernard Hill playing this character mm. is so good. <laughs> so, yeah, he's so, he's so effective, literally. But this, yes. uh, but it, it, it is what it is. It's someone who you in 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 what is, after all, to some degree, a story of high drama and melodrama. He's somebody you could sort of like you could react to. I mean, his I mean, in his sense of contributions as well. I mean, the famous line, you know, no parent should have to bury their child. Oh. He himself, of course, mm-hmm. said My that God. he picked that up from when he was acting in a drama about um, you know IRA bombings or something like that. Mm. He was speaking with someone who had lost their own child, and she said that to him and he just filed that away and he found the moment to introduce that in and that's a good example of an actor being able to contribute something that locks in my god incredibly well and mm-hmm. is able to then you know deliver with you know when he then finally breaks down you know it just sort of like it's sort of everything that's happened to him finally crushes in on him so it's uh, yeah 
it's uh, it's it's a believable the three of them together regardless of how their characters or what's been changed in the book you yeah. can imagine the three of them functioning as a family as what's left of a family essentially yeah. uh, mm-hmm. tra- being a reigning family trying to do their best for their people and you do get a sense of you do get a strong sense of that uh, especially when Theoden is finally pulled back. Then there's Brad Dourif's worm tongue. Oh my god. I love I, him. <laughs> one of my one of my greatest regrets uh I was doing uh a lot of the interviews for a Deadwood book that recently oh, right. came out. Yes. Finally, <laughs> I was like 3 years of work and I was trying and trying to to get Brad Dourif and uh like it just kept getting kept getting put off and and put off. And the author of the book, Matt Zoller Sites, finally did get to interview him, but Mm -hmm. I didn't. And I'm to this day, I'll like, I'm so sad that I didn't get to. For anyone, you know, if if, if Brad Dorff's just, you know, acting credentials roles, I mean, you know, endless, endless. Uh, For me, I would have first encountered him in Lynch's Dune back in 84. Um, Shortly thereafter, I think I would have seen uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. He, of course, has a prime role in that. And again, just so many character roles. And again, famous Chucky, as in Child's Play, <laughs> did, uh, did the voice for that, and endless, endless other roles. And so, in in doing this one, he, he gives Worm Tongue a sense of you know, Worm Tongue in the book is a great little character, but this one you get mm-hmm. a sense of oh, okay, there's more going on here. You know, you get a sense the that he's Ebert pretty Chancellor, himself. kind of. Yeah, himself. yeah. He just he's he's a little more active and a little more actively vile. He's almost you could say you know they make him almost cartoonishly vile, but, um, but yeah, uh, but, that's the thing though. Like especially because Rohan in general, is way more grounded than the rest of the trilogy. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, Rohan and the Shire are kind of on par in terms of, like, we're just having a normal time here. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, they're like the horse lords or whatever, but they're still just, like, people. They're doing whatever. Yeah. But then Brad Dourif, Wormtongue, is wandering around like he's coming out of an opera. <laughs> like, <laughs> fair, like, fair, he's fair. just been pulled right from Wagner or something. He's mm-hmm. just... He's so evil. He's wandering around in his big, like, black cloaks black. and everything. <laughs> he looks like a grub. And, <laughs> like, it doesn't make sense that he has achieved this status. Like, sure. how did he get here? He just looks like a bad guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, it kind of, like, he's great as this, like, operatic kind of camp villain. But also, mm-hmm. why is this character doing this in the middle of this setting? Why does he, right. why is it, why is that going on? Yeah. I don't know. So I go back and forth because he's so great. Like, right. I love Worm Tongue as, like, a, a Wagner character, yeah. basically. Mm-hmm. But also, when nobody else around him is doing Wagner, he's, like, wandered into an Ibsen play. <laughs> as <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> as like a nibble i feel like i always interpreted it as like he is uh, like most of his influence was sort of ma- uh, um, semi-magical almost in that yes, like Sa- saruman saruman kind of you know imbued him with this ability to whisper spell or and whisper whatever. poison into the yeah. king's ear yeah. mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. the one moment though i like I do love getting a sense that, you know, when Grima goes back to Worm t- or when he goes back to Saruman and mm-hmm. it, like it's like there's no force that could ever take Helm's Deep and uh-huh. then Saruman shows him and there's this tear. And I know yeah. that it's like really it is over the top, but I love it because I love that it shows that like Grima is in over his head. I don't mm-hmm. think he actually no, he I, did not I don't want think it's this. over the top. I think that's such a good like even if he wasn't this camp villain, doing that is still a great choice. It like totally. It's like yeah, you know, we've all been in situations where we've just gotten in over our heads, and mm-hmm. oh no, now like you know, we've we've reaped or we've sown, and now we're reaping, and yeah, it's like, no good. In his mind, it was probably like. Rohan's just gonna I'm gonna be king of Rohan or whatever yeah. like it's it's I'm gonna be or I'm gonna be the steward of Rohan ruling for Saruman like that kind of thing but now he's looking at the actual destruction of Rohan and going like oh no mm-hmm. <laughs> this is not what I signed up for yeah. and yet he can't get out of it nope yeah what he signed up for is to reference a scene that you know very that I think Reasonably well done takes some of Tolkien's words and replaces them and things like this. The confrontation scene between her, him, and Eowyn over Theodred's, mm-hmm. you know, beer, mm-hmm. essentially, where he dies. Yeah. You know, that's one of those things that are like, that, that's exactly where the level where this worm tongue wants to be. And uh, Durif there is able to, yeah, he may be sort of like, it may be a bit camping up, but oh, he's so delicious about it. It's a wonderful <laughs> confrontation between just him going like, and like, and Miranda Otto's characterization, playing Eowyn was literally someone who 
barely has anywhere to turn, you know, literally mm-hmm. stock still while he's like, you know, walking around her. I just like a wonderful interaction. And to, to give again, more credit to Brand Otto, who I think you know, really, we, we talk about, really does imbue Eowyn with a certain different kind of strength that I would have expected necessarily from the book. I don't know what I was expecting until yeah. I saw the performance. And, uh, and then I think the, the, the scene that I think, you know, clicks for a lot of people, I, I would guess is the one where, you know, she's playing around with the sword, you know, Aragorn comes up, they have like, they give each other looks mm-hmm. and then, you know, and then she explains where she's coming from. And then it's sort of, that's weird. little that's a really good balanced tension between the two actors and delivering mm-hmm. those lines. I thought, you know, it, it plays, it plays out where you can start to see the idea that this Eowyn would fall for this Aragorn. Yeah. I guess is the yeah. best way to put it. Not necessarily the Tolkien version, but mm-hmm. how it plays out in this particular one here. But yeah, sort of stepping back, looking again, maybe maybe to wrap this up for Ron for now. Yeah, the whole the whole yeah, everyone we talked we already brought this up, you know, well, we gotta go from here to Helm's Deep and we're going to the and this is not the book. The book is the book is, oh my god, things are bad. Quick, send out the army. Run, run, run. Oh, well, they've been defeated at the Fords. Uh, where do we go? Helm's yeah. Deep's over there. Let's go. Let's you know, that's group yeah. and meet at the fortress. Yeah. yeah. And then Gandalf's like, I got an idea and I'll bring back some help. Bye. <laughs> you know, yeah. he's yeah. like, you know, that, and that's all it. And again, Aomer is part of this whole thing. He's not mm-hmm. been banished. He's around. <laughs> you know, th- that change. And again, everything that falls, that falls from it, you could say, is, you know, the whole, we get the war battle. Nah, you know, it feels very overly long now that I'm watching it now. It's just sort of like, okay, you know, a quick ward like attack, like from an advanced scouting party could work. You can make that last for a couple of minutes. Uh, sort of like, whoop, you know, they'll, they'll, okay, be more on your guard, but not to have it be this big thing. And the real problem, I would argue, <laughs> with the Aragorn goes over the cliff thing is simply this, is that looking ahead a bit, it makes... The the big climactic moment for the whole sequence of films, Gollum and Frodo going over the edge in Mount yeah. Doom, sort of like we've seen this before. You know, yeah. it's, it's it's really really bad for them to do that beat twice, and that's looking ahead. But that's another reason why I have a problem with it. It's just like, yeah. No, it wastes time and it doesn't. Speaking of Frodo and Sam, who we haven't talked about at all, should, I find, we that, I find it really we telling. And we should talk about the one big new, other big new characters. And just well, Faramir as well. Andy Circus, Gollum, the entire performance. We got to get into it. Let's get love into it. it. So, I it's love so it. Good. It's so good. It's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing looking back at this twenty-year-old movie and going. Mm-hmm. Actually, aside from a few little janky bits, this yeah. Gollum is still like incredible, fully fully realized yeah. and believable and it's the skin. it's yeah <gasps> the skin his face doesn't like it's normally not uncanny valley there are moments there are moments yeah i have there's always one moment in mind i have but yeah but it's it's so good like i was thinking of like look watch this movie and going i think special effects overall haven't gotten better than this no. in the last 20 years mm-hmm. they're they have improved in a lot of ways but they haven't improved much right I think, like, it's interesting because the technology has proceeded apace, but Mm -hmm. I think because of that, visual effects artists are just literally never given enough time. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's like, articles about Marvel pushing their artists to produce things in, like, 24 hours or whatever. It's like this and Avatar are the only movies where the artists have been given enough time. Yeah. To actually fully, I mean, Avatar is a whole other thing, but uh, this, at least it's one character interacting Mm -hmm. with the environment. And that does make things like you are only, you are focusing on that one character. It's not building an entire environment and characters in addition to Mm -hmm. everything. Like, Mm -hmm. uh, that means you should just do that more. Yeah. Like just just one guy, just (laughs) one guy. (laughs) Yeah. But I mean, also the special effects wouldn't matter as much if the performance wasn't so. He has such also, a yes, such mm-hmm. a specific vision of the character that yeah, it's maybe a little more cartoony and animalistic in a way than the book, mm-hmm. but yeah. mm-hmm. still like it works. Yeah, it's he's so good. I I didn't fully appreciate how good he was until watching this again after years of not watching it and going, oh my god, <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I I'm mad that he didn't get an Oscar for this. Right? Genuinely. He should have. Genuinely. It's, 
it's an astounding performance. I really think the Academy or anyone was like, how do, how do we honor this? How do you honor something that's a syncretic performance? Mm-hmm. And again, it's very, it is, we talked about this. Let's see, put, let's put this into play. I mean, Jackson himself famously in one of the, one of the more obscure behind the scenes things of the time, but I still remember the quote. He's basically, I think talking with his, he's, he's talking with his own team or he may be trying to get message back to the studio. He's just basically pointing out, well, you know, you can do one of two ways with this. And this is being filming back in 99. So wow. he's like, we can do, want to is we can try and aim for and he's talking technical level here he's like we can try and aim for the jar jar uh binks approach or we could try to do the monkey in lost in space approach which <laughs> nobody remembers the 97 lost in space but there's a cgi oh, monkey i think in that. about that monkey so often <laughs> all right maybe you'll do <laughs> yeah i saw that movie as a really little like soon after it came out so i was pretty young and yeah, i yeah, was yeah. freaked out by that goddamn monkey <laughs> oh my god <laughs> Yeah, it's it's, it's been twenty. Eight. Yeah, it's, it's been twenty twenty five years since that monkey appeared, and yeah, that's sort of sort of like the that prior prior ultimately to George R. Binks coming out, which whatever you want to say, technical achievement um, was yeah, you know, yeah. Was, props uh, to the it actor. Looks, for it's a for stupid that. character, but it looks great. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So, side note, my argument is uh, half the problems people would have with Phantom Menace would be if you had both the Trade Federation guys and George R. Binks speak in non English and just have subtitles would right? work just Dude. would solve so many God. problems. Yeah. So uh, many problems. Yeah, Just, one, seven, solve them all. But one solve one so many way problems. to eliminate, you know, the her- horrific, unnecessary racism. <laughs> <laughs> Let's yeah, but different podcast. So anyway, so but so with that in mind, yeah. So like these were the models. So this really did feel like whoa. Okay, we've 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 seriously elevated here. And mm-hmm. there's you know Andy Circus's own book on the making of Gollum with contributions from the team and you know, all the other behind the scenes stuff. There's so much out there. So I don't want to just go through all that again. But yeah, no, the effect of this ultimately does come down to the fact that you have a very physical actor who is able to throw himself into performances mm-hmm. and has an astounding control of his voice because that's yeah. the key thing. Yeah. His voice has to work. Um, his expressions, how it's translated, tr- things like this. You know, you can you can see Circus through the design of the character. You know, you, mm-hmm. they, they did a very good job of carrying it over as much as possible. You get that sense of him. And, of course, that's reinforced with the footage in uh, Return of the King later. I think of Milwaukee even something as simple as the uh, the confrontation, the scene where Gollum, you know, they're still in the Emin Mule, and Gollum still got the rope on him, and Frodo sort of like you know, ask him a couple of questions, you know, you can you can show us the way and all that, and like Gollum answers once, sort of a hesitant yes, and then you know Frodo asks another question, and then it's the second time that Gollum says this sort of nervous, yes, and it's this very mm-hmm. precise way of just saying one yeah. word, and yeah. it's like an in the moment ooh. That's exactly right. You know, the yeah. character would say that at that moment right there and act the way it does. And uh, and there's there's a weird sort of gentle humor that comes up at points, too, or at least he, things. He, Gollum with the rope on him uh, acts like when you put a harness on a cat. Mm-mm. Just yeah. <laughs> like, flopping. And I don't know. I, I like notice that now that I have seen cats with the harnesses on them flop thanks to the internet uh, well, didn't he, he based a lot of the golem stuff on his own cat didn't he like oh, that makes so the yeah. golem noise is like cocking up a hairball <laughs> that makes now sense. Yeah, yeah 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 that's right that is correct yeah that famous the famous <laughs> voice we should i mean we should delve into one scene in particular because if there was if there was a meme worthy scene if there was a meme proto meme of its time it oh, is yeah. the the split personality yes. scene uh-huh. now how do we feel about that scene because it's one of those cases where i think you know from the book I don't think they could have carried over the scene as written in the book. I think it's far too, you know, it's it's it's, it's a different kind of subtlety. It's slightly abstract. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like it's, it works on the page, but it yeah. works on the page visually. brilliantly. And I think the the main thing that the scene does in the movie here is that it changes at least our expectations. Whereas in the uh, in the book, it's clearly the fact that you know you know <laughs> slinker and stinker, uh, you know, and all that <laughs> is to, to use t- Sam's terminology that the the golem personality is sort of there, and the the what remains of Smeagol is kind of terrified of Gollum mm-hmm. and sort of like, you know, it's sort of like trying to argue the case, but basically it's sort of like, and there's this weird little intensity. Whereas here, seemingly, it is more meant to be a battle on equal terms. Although, yeah. of course, uh, although, of course, the Gollum, uh, the, the Gollum, the bad side, you know, gets in the knife in murderer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, when he says that and that breakdown there. But I, I think the scene still works. It's, it's, it's crude. And I think it's a very sort in the sense of uh, you know, this is my own personal take on it, uh, as with time and experience, how we talk about 
whether we want to call them split personalities, whether even the term schizophrenia is even viable. You know, how we look at it now, I think, in terms of uh, the greater understandings of what we might consider therapy, mental health and all that. It's one of those things you look and go like, I don't know. You know, it's sort of it's sort of it's a thing that both works and doesn't work. But I don't know what you think. I mean, this is just my own thing of a sort of like it's a powerful scene and yet it's also regressive now. Maybe. I don't know. No, I didn't even think about that. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I I, I personally don't have that have have that problem with it. And I actually like I don't know, this could be because it just imprinted on me Mm. when I was 15. But I do still (laughs) I do still think it works, at least for me. Uh, I, I do like it isn't subtle at all. But I think now I'm currently like rejecting subtlety. In all its forms <laughs> and filmmaking. I reject subtlety in all I'm its forms. I'm rejecting words. subtlety <laughs> right now. So this is like totally, I'm still totally will, uh, with this. I think the, the performance is just so strong. It is. That I think that it just kind of overwhelms any misgivings I might have about it. Even though, like, yeah, would it be better to have, like, not make it quite so you know Fragment split personality yeah. yeah like it probably would and i bet i bet they could have done it but i don't know it still works for me i don't know i don't view it in mental health terms right okay, fair, is the fair, thing yeah fair. i just want to point out, point out in case somebody misunderstood some maybe ned was saying um schizophrenia is not dissociative identity disorder they're separate right. conditions mm-hmm, schizophrenia mm-hmm. is auditory you know external hallucinations that kind of thing and disassociative identity disorder is heavy air quotes multiple personalities they don't call them that that's you know but anyway it just doesn't it's not that kind of thing to me i know it could be read that way i'm sure people are reading it that way but oh people absolutely read it that way i mean mm-hmm. if, it, if it occurred to one of us it's going to occur to multiple people and they're going to take it way more seriously yeah <laughs> um but it's not portrayed as a as like Gollum having a mental health disorder it's portrayed as Gollum just not having anybody to talk to uh, more right. so in the book Gollum like talks to himself and has learned to externalize certain <laughs> behaviors mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. the movie makes it a little more like uh, split personality I guess but it also doesn't ever use those terms and it's not right right I think if they did it now they would definitely get a lot of what angry letters from people who do read it in those terms and that's valid I mean, mm-hmm. you can be mad about something that resembles a condition and maybe demonizes it I that. think it reflects the strength of uh, Tolkien's original creation of it too. I mean, you know, that's a, you know, we haven't really done a Gollum episode yet, and one of these no. days we we'll probably get around to it because oh, I mean, yeah. it's it's just such a fascinating character, and you know, we don't want to take too much time to delve into it in and of itself. No. But I think it's 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 really well done. And then, you know, we uh, this just occurred to me uh, earlier today, just thinking about the movie, just sort of skipping ahead to to another scene that's sort of a, a problem <laughs> in, in wider terms, not not in the sense I was talking about more more natural sort of like eh, is. Uh, how we get more, of course, of uh, of uh, Gollum and uh, good moments and things as that part of the story continues on. And it is important to note, we should back up at this point, this is one of the things that's very obvious, but it's very true. Part of the reason why the structure of the film and Return of the King works the way it does, I'm not saying it works successfully, it just simply works the way it does, is precisely because, of course, you can't pull off the trick that Tolkien was able to do. Separate yeah. out one half yeah. the story, right. then the other half. That does not apply here. The only time I've ever seen that applied in an adaptation of Lord of the Rings is the American radio version of Lord of the Rings, which, as I said a few times, sucks. So, you know, <laughs> just sort of like, just forget that, you know, if you want to experience it that way, go ahead and listen to this. You will also hate yourself, so don't do it. <laughs> so, but, um, we, so we get, we get these little moments of going one way. I love the, you know, the abbreviated, the abbreviated uh, herbs and stew rabbit sequences. Uh, frankly, a delight. <laughs> you know, and all potatoes. That. So, yeah, yeah. Just, just a great bit. You know, you, you get that little sense of it, and you also get a sense of Gollum maybe a little more, you know, in the moment there, you know, they are fresh, they are young. Yeah, the, the cracking and, the spines and everything. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> and and I love the little moments. Andy Circus talks about this in the commentary uh, to to Towers, where he talks about uh, he talks about like uh, there's one bit where you see him sort of shake his fist uh, up in the air and all that, and, and he sort of says, "Yeah, there's him like going like, ha the yellow face, I've defeated you, I've, mm-hmm. I've come with a thing." And I thought that's a nice little moment to throw in. You don't need to explain. You can talk about it in moments like this, but you don't need to over explain it in the story. And I thought yeah. that's a 
uh, you know, a good way to do small acting in that sort of moment there. But, but I'm thinking, you know, uh, how in the theatrical version that uh, we get Gollum up through the Hennetha Noon sequence, and then he doesn't really reappear again until, I mean, he appears, but we don't get him again until the very end of the film, mm-hmm. where we get another mm-hmm. one of his dialogues, although in a much different way as you set up the third film. But uh, the thing I, I think I want to point out is that whatever happens with that, you know, the sort of, you know, the differing, you know, talking to oneself, however one of you for it, that it all builds up to that moment, which again, the scene I have such problems with, but when Faramir is confronting Gollum after Callum's mm-hmm. like, you know, been beaten down and is cowering uh, up against the wall. And he basically, where I think was a genius move to actually not show his face when he's having the debate with himself. Mm -hmm. I thought that was pretty slick. You having set that up early in the film, you don't need to show it again. Have the acting literally be acting projected from behind. How rare mm-hmm. and good is that to be able to make that work? That's that's something you can't even get many human actors to do. Right. So. <laughs> and then just that moment where he turns around where it's 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 it just almost feels too much, but it all's right. What do you steal? Mm-hmm. My precious. <laughs> and just explodes yeah. you're like, yeah. you know, that's yeah. it. Just fantastically well done. But that scene is the one that was again a conversation with Faramir. So mm-hmm. Faramir. Oh, yeah. Let's talk boy, about boy. Faramir. Let's talk about our boy. <laughs> the best boy. He is. He's unless our... you're watching this movie. It's, it's, so it's it's it. Once again, it is one of those things where, from a west like Western quote unquote screenwriting perspective, mm. like mm-hmm. uh, an American movie studio executive perspective, let's say, I understand why they felt they had to do this. Mm-hmm. It sucks. It sucks yeah. so deeply, and I don't think it's necessary. I actually, I think you could have Faramir waver when they're in the, they waver, and maybe they even set out. Like, Faramir takes Frodo and Sam and is going to take them to Denethor himself, because it doesn't mm-hmm. really make sense for me, uh, like, that he would just send them off with someone yeah. else. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. Especially if he wants to if he win wants a kiss, to from, kiss daddy, from daddy, then, yes. then he's going to take them himself. <laughs> right, yeah, 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 yeah. God, that video provided such a, a rich <laughs> vein of material for talking about <laughs> parental issues. <laughs> anyway, Faramir, Faramir wants the kiss from Daddy. He's gonna he's gonna march them there himself. Um, I like I think that could actually be okay. And then maybe the Nazgul flies overhead and mm-hmm. you know smacks some sense into Faramir. Yeah, like the, seeing Frodo react to the Nazgul exactly, or something. Exactly, something like without that. Without getting all the way to Asgillia. Right, because yeah. actually, like, my huge problem with the Asgillia scene, uh, A of all, it, it's just, like, so long. Why is it even there? It's just yeah. time-wasting. <laughs> it is, and it also detracts from the, like, it, it takes, it, it, it draws focus from Helm's Deep. Okay, fine, you have this, like, you want Helm's Deep, the Battle of Helm's Deep to be your big battle. It's what, you know, we've been leading up to this whole damn movie Mm -hmm. uh but we're also gonna have another battle now yeah if you're gonna if you're gonna cut away from it cut to something that contrasts exactly you cannot cut to another battle i do not have the focus for this like i (laughs) i don't even like this guy sam is also acting like a jerk and i don't like him right now that was another like they they felt the need to lean too far i think into setting sam up as sort of like too distrustful and mean. yeah and like not getting it yeah he's just not like he's not great to Gollum in the book but this takes it further too much same with faramir where it's like yeah. yes i understand that you don't want it to be as easy as it is for faramir to reject the ring in the books yeah. like it is maybe a little too easy he's just like no i wouldn't uh, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Well, I mean, that provides in the in the book that provides a really valuable viewpoint of the limitations of the ring yes. and all that. I think we talked about right. this in our Denethor Boromir Faramir episode, where it's like if you don't want power, the ring has no power over you. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So it works there here where they're, you know, Middle Earth again is a little more desperate and dangerous. Right. It right. makes more sense that he would waver. Yeah, I but would if, agree. If yeah. they want to lean into that. Why aren't they keeping, again, the material with Boromir, where Boromir is clearly, like, the unfavorite? Exactly. Like, why why not include that and cut some other stuff? And then you have a much stronger understanding of this guy who, in the theatrical edition, comes off as just kind of, like, mean? 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like he's agreed. just kind he's of just a, a dick. <laughs> yeah. There's no, there's no motivation for him right. except to be just an obstacle. Whereas having, even if I don't agree with this vision of Faramir, having this other material would make that make a lot more sense and make it a little more uh, meaningful when he's like, I'm taking you to, you're, you're going to daddy, you know, <laughs> <laughs> going to get the kiss from daddy. <laughs> Oh yeah, bring, bring bring over the little guys and show them what's going on. What? <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, but the yeah the it's a pity because I do think David Wenham is a pretty good actor and I think he has a very him. interesting mm-hmm. range. Yeah, he's a lot better in Return of the King than he is here. I think I would agree. Yeah. And uh, and if you haven't seen him in films like uh, The Proposition or something like that, uh, check that out. Good stuff. So and <laughs> frankly, he also does. I've seen him in his Mulan room. <laughs> Oh, that's right. He was. No, the film I was thinking of was, I'll give you an artifact from the early 2000s, Van Helsing. Remember that? Oh, I my never God. Saw right. He was he was the assistant monk to that. And, of course, he was also the in three. assistant monk. He's, the, he's, his little, he's like the goofy, he's the goofy cartoon monk helping out, uh, or a cartoonish monk helping out uh, helping out uh, Hugh Jackman's Van Helsing. It's, it's again, ridiculous film. The and early then, course, aughts the, were just a wild time. Yeah, yeah. And then he was the, and then he's essentially the narrator in 300. So, I mean, weird career. No more. I, I think remember about it, so. seeing him in 300 and being like, hello. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you might as well show off. I'm, so, I'm ignoring so. all the fascist stuff in yeah. this movie. <laughs> Minor details. Hello. <laughs> so, um, Look, the physique is inseparable from the fascism, though. Yeah. <laughs> Alas. And again, another podcast. <laughs> another podcast. Not the abs. I'm I'm actually like kind of anti ab, but he has good face in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe because there are a couple other things beyond actors I want to talk about, but maybe to just like end on an actor's note, let's talk about maybe just continuing work by our fellowship characters into this one and all that. Of course, mm-hmm. the biggest arguable change, well, there are two probably, is that uh, is that we get Gandalf back as a different Gandalf. So mm-hmm. Ian McKellen's gentle variation on the performance is kind of interesting. We talked uh, briefly in the uh, Rings of Power episode about how the idea, how the stranger realizes who he is, you know, when he's, you know, or who he is or who he isn't when mm-hmm. the cultists do the thing. And Jared, you brought up the point that similarly, that sort of like is a too self-conscious echo of the whole idea mm-hmm. that, you know, Gandalf, Gandalf, Gandalf. And I do like that moment because as you said, Jared, yeah. it's like Ian McKellen suddenly snaps into Gandalf mode from that point, mm-hmm. uh, which I think is a very interesting bit right there. Although he is, he is sort of generally gentler, but I like where the wit comes in. I mean, one of my favorite moments is qua moments in the film, because there are a lot of individual, just fun little moments or the bit where everyone has to, you know, give up their weapons before they can go into Metasel. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And of course, everyone takes off everything. You know, it's just I do love the humor of just everyone's just drawing out eight million knives or whatever. It's a classic movie stuff. trope. Yeah. <laughs> Great stuff. Your staff. Oh. He would not part an old man from his wife. I love the wink. Yeah. The wink is great. I'm sorry. Yeah. I love it. The wink it may is not great. be book Gandalf, but it's and, great. <laughs> and then it leads to, uh, not to go back to praising Brad Dorif again, but m- like I think my second favorite line reading in the entire, on all three movies, the first one is uh, Boromir going, they have a cave troll. Uh, <laughs> and the second one is is Grima Wormtongue going, I told you to take the wizard's staff. And like, it's just, why would you think you <laughs> shouldn't like yeah, yeah it's like you uh, just the like the petty the petty aggrieved tone yeah. just kills yeah. me every time <laughs> uh, so, so that's that's wonderful yeah it's interesting Ned, that you have referred to Gandalf here as gentler because I always read him as a little bit steelier than he stiffer. was before. Yeah. Like he's, he's, I don't know he's stiffer steelier, exactly, but, but he's, he's sort of lost he, the yeah. the um the verve almost, and like the not folksiness, but like this is a Gandalf that is not as good as, at being among hobbits in a way. Yeah, yeah. Like you can't mm. picture this Gandalf just hanging out in the Shire. Right, right. He's much less of a people person. Yeah, he's a little more focused. He has a much much narrower sense of his mission, I guess. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's a really interesting, subtle change. Like, it's still recognizably Gandalf, but he's mm-hmm. now a little less avuncular and a yeah. little more like, okay, I'm like, he's a paladin now. He got a, he yeah, got yeah. a keratin hair treatment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's got that, so he's got he's I mean, got look, the... it's very straight. In this, mm-hmm. He had this beautiful great gray waves. In Valinor. <laughs> hey, they, they, got, they got covered. Yeah, I know. It came back in one piece. Uh, yeah, we got. Yeah, this is the movie with the trip out sequence. It's like, where did we go? Um, I love that yeah. so much. It, it's just striking. Yeah, the, the whole battle. I mean, 
Yeah, it looks, uh, again, stepping back a bit, but the whole bit where, you know, our, our Gandalf the Grey and the Balrog, that one moment at the end where it suddenly yeah, it opens wide, we're outside the chasm, and you just see the fire falling. Oh, that's down such a thing, good shot. And the music swells. It's sort of like, oh, okay, there's your operatic moment. Thank you. Yeah. So just one of many just striking moments where everything comes together. Um, let's see. Uh, Christopher Lee, again, is a perfectly well done Christopher Lee. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Mary and Pippin, we sort of talked about, you know, they, they you know, Bill, Billy, and, Billy and Dominic do their best. Um, let's see. Uh, we we start to get Legolas turning into a superhero. Uh, oh yeah, the horse yeah. leap, the surfing sequence, all the leggy moments as they called them. Like so. all the what your elf eyes see business. <laughs> like hobbits to Isengard. <laughs> Half of Orlando Bloom's screen time in this is just him looking inscrutably into the distance. Yeah. Like, and it is a comedy moment for Gimli, but I do like the, oh, come on, we can take him after Aragorn's looking around the corner at all the all the works coming. I was like, yeah, we can do this. So, okay, I, I'll allow for that. So um, you, but, get um, you, get you get one. You get one. You get one. You get one. Although maybe I do also like, or should I get you a box? Pause. <laughs> you know, sort of like yeah, just... I, that's, that's the one that I pick. I mean, everything yeah, else yeah, could yeah, go, yeah. but the box one is like, it feels like a microaggression, but it's also like, but because he it's laughs, kind of, like... he laughs, he's like, okay, yeah. <laughs> Uh, like... <laughs> you know, we do, in fact, have an Apple box uh, in our household for me so that I can <laughs> reach I wasn't things. going to go there, but That's okay. That's so cute. <laughs> we, sure, we sure do have one. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. Um, let's see. Uh, I could, I'm sure they're going to be there, but I want to pull out to just sort of like moments. I just sort of indicated mm-hmm. the film where like we just we couple of words, sort of like whatever else is going on, whatever it's oddities got a are lot happening. Of good, really good, strikingly moments. Really good mm-hmm. moments. I mean, I do love the the build up toward, even though it's a movie variation, not the book. The idea that Gandalf and Saruman are fighting through Theoden's body, essentially, and that like you know everything picks up. It's one of those I things. I actually I, like that. I I'm God, so, I hate I'm that sorry. so much. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. No, no, you can hate it. You can hate it. But the thing I was going to point out about that sequence that always, I think, just really works as pure like a film, because let's talk about film qua film, is basically the bit where it's sort of like where, you know, it seems like Gandalf is like as you're hit or struck out at theater, and, and then the edit seamlessly yeah. flops into Saruman ca- cascading back down in Isengard on the floor. I'm like, that's nicely done. I think that's even yeah. slicker. I think it's even slicker than the CGI transformation of Theoden suddenly becoming young again, which again uh, which is, is an invention still... for the the film that like uh and jared i know that you don't like how like it how looks, much of that that is yeah like it e- looks really it's really well done effect, i just don't like it as a yeah. as an element of the thing yeah right the, yeah, the, so. the effect itself is beyond incredible uh mm-hmm. like i still can't believe that they it's so seamless it looks like it's literally frame by frame that they like went yeah, through. yeah like, yeah. It's like very... going in like hand coloring or yeah. whatever it's like yeah, no, it's really good. My objection to this scene yeah. <laughs> yeah, same. is this overlaps a little bit with like that's not how it is in the book, is that in the book, Theoden's issue is that he's basically suffering from depression and Saruman and Wormtongue are taking advantage of that and making him feel even more hopeless mm-hmm. and just telling him like, basically just give up. Just right. sit here yes. and yeah. be conquered because that's what's going to happen anyway. If you act at all, it will make no difference. You mm. have no hope. Just die. In the book, what happens is Gandalf shows up and he's like, you know, I've come with bad news before. I've still got some bad news, but I have some good news. It's not wholly hopeless. You can take an action that could matter. Mm -hmm. And isn't that worth it? There's Mm -hmm. just the chance that you could affect the world for for good. And that works. And it is, you know, you, you don't see the conversation. You don't hear exactly what Gandalf says to him to make him like perk up. But it's a moment of almost like almost like therapy, <laughs> like <laughs> like talking really him. quick therapy. Really, mm-hmm. well, I mean, magically, he's got the ring that kindles hearts or whatever. You know, it's it's a little magically enforced too, but it works because it's an example of somebody just encouraging somebody, just like, come on, bro, like we're all in this together. I've got your back. I know I've been a pain before. I will continue to be a pain, <laughs> but I'm here for you. I will right. help you. And it, right. it's it's nice. It's very lovely, and then it's it's very subtle, and the like then they go outside and the wind rushes in like all of that really sensory detail sells and all that he and touched movie, grass he goes out yeah, and touches he, he grass, goes outside he and touches touches grass. grass. <laughs> yeah yeah whereas the movie you know, i i actually agree with you on that level Jared, I th- completely. yes you yeah, are yeah. correct yeah but in the in the movie 
it's like so the solution to being old and depressed is just to have a wizard hit you with a staff right yeah yeah like yeah. oh that fixes your problem totally. like it doesn't no it doesn't <laughs> I, like it kind of it kind of works in this context but i feel like it robs so much of the meaning especially it, it could make a great not foreshadowing but like interplay with sam's speech at the end about like stories that yeah, matter I mean, like the, it's a different the theme, kind of the theme of this yeah. whole movie is uh, you know hope and and or the lack thereof <laughs> yeah because mm. like 20 different people in this movie say do not trust to hope there is yeah no just hope. forsaken these lands there is no is hope. there hope is yeah. there like i like it's just like so but yes. like yeah when the moments that i find really moving in fiction tend to be things like somebody just like you know i'm I got your back. Not literally in those mm, words, yeah. but mm -hmm. those like small actions of encouragement, I think, are really, really great. And that's what happens in the book. And the movie kind of undercuts its own theme by being like, actually, the only solution magic. is magic. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, that doesn't that doesn't make me feel better about bad things that are happening. Right. That makes right. me feel like, okay, so I can't fix it because nobody is going to come hit me with a staff and get rid of the bad. Have it have the depression beaten out of you? Yeah, I was like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what doms are for. Um, hey. <laughs> hey, who knew? <laughs> hey, kids, uh, ask your parents. Oh, my um, God. <laughs> what have we done? Yeah. Uh, no, but, like, but for real. So I feel it begins, it's, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, just, it does bother me that it undercuts its own themes by right. having yes. magical solutions to things that aren't magical in the book. It's just like, Totally. Yeah. More unfair, um, more unfair. Although I do want to bring up really fast another fade and moment. If we're talking about moments, I thought you were going to lead into this when you were talking about the Helm's Deep moment. Okay. But when it starts to rain. Oh yes. Uh, and Theoden just kind of looks up and he's like, this might as well happen. Yep. yep. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, no, that, yeah, I'm sure. Sure. Yeah, it's going to yeah. rain. It's, Burn it <laughs> it's such, such a perfect moment. And it, this moment of quiet kind of like, okay, right before everything gets really bad is so, it's funny, but it's also really hard. It's so complicated. Mm -hmm. And it's just like some guy mm -hmm. looking up at the rain. And it's also, and, and the music kicks in right at that moment too. The mm -hmm. sort of softer strings and all yeah. that. Yeah. So an, another great moment. Um, Let's see other moments for me. I was thinking of just a few right now. I mean, I do like the, I do like the, the cinematography and how it's done with the, uh, with the, uh, when, 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 Amir and his band meet up with Aragorn and Legolas and everything's like tight focused and mm -hmm. sort of like handheld sort of like it's a good sort of like you know okay we're all in the thick of it you know everybody's mm -hmm. sort of jostling around nervous I think that's really or just really sharp um, the famous moment where uh, Aragorn uh, you know kicks the uh, kicks the helmet and yells and in real life oh he broke his toe <laughs> you know? and you, you are required when watching that movie to turn to the person next to you and say do you know that when he kicked that helmet he broke his toe and that's why he's screaming it's a law I'm pretty <laughs> I, sure it's I, in I the know. constitution I know that I married correctly because my husband was the one who who was oh. like, yeah, he he was the one to say that this time. So good. Yes. <laughs> All right, good job, good job there. <laughs> the uh, let's see, uh, I, I I I'm going to admit something. I never minded the meats back on the menu line vo thing until. Oh my god, me. Okay, I have this in my notes, Ned. I feel the <laughs> same way, actually. The only time I even self consciously even thought about it was <laughs> when the extended version came out, and I was listening to all the commentaries, and it's John Howe, of all people, in the commentaries, who says, You know what's sort of funny about this line is that implies that they, they, had, they had a menu to start with, and you could do substitutions. But what do I know? And he just sort of treats it just sort of as casually sort of thing and i thought you know he raises a good point but i just rolled with it and now it's this thing and i'm like no 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 john howe's reaction was all those needed i'm sorry to I, me I, it does fit in the context it doesn't feel yeah, it feels like a contextual place, riff yeah yeah but because the orcs feel so infantrymen type like they're they, kind of doing their own thing yeah, yeah. I, for me it, it never it never really felt out of place to me yeah um yeah even though I do recognize that it is kind of, but it just never really felt that way for me. It never really twigged that sense, which is odd given who I was 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> mm. I also just like the, just the funniness of the whole sequence where it's like, you know, they're tearing apart that one or body having him chopped off. You see like intestines flying back. Yeah. Why are they yeah. wasting <laughs> that? That's nutritious. Yeah. You yeah. Nutritious. Right there. And, and, uh, and the other bit I like, which was revealed in the commentary among the actors is that most of those voices are Andy Serkis doing a bunch of overdubs. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> so basically that's he's right. arguing with himself. I kind of love it. So, you know, I think that's fantastic. Um, gosh, what else? Uh, I do think the 
sequence, even though, again, the whole how they've handled it and what they did with it, with the whole, uh, you know, we get the extended weird love story dream <laughs> vision thing, too, it back just... to Arwen and all that. Um, I do like the portrayal of what we get ultimately in the appendices of Lord of the Rings, <laughs> done properly, <laughs> where we have where we have the, the funeral sequence for Athena and, and all that. I thought that was like, how she know? Could be, you know, just sort of mm-hmm. like how, how it's going there. Um, uh, and there are some interesting musical moments, too. Let me just throw in the music. I mean, again, Howard Shore, out of the park. Yeah. The Rohan theme the every time. Oh, my God. The Rohan theme alone. I mean, that was I'm talk about with instantly, yearning. I'm just yeah. filled with iconic. yearning. Instantly iconic. That was genius. I'm just, you know, I as, astoundingly good, astoundingly great. Yes. It, one, that whole thing alone beats out the entire thing that everything Bear McCreary did for the Rings of Power. I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> Sorry, right. man. Sorry. Dude, just ridiculous. And Gollum's song. Gollum's song. Miliana Torini hitting Ooh. on all cylinders. Ooh. That 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 song has gotten even better in my mind with time, I have yeah. to say. At the time, yeah. I was thinking, it's like, God, they really wanted Bjork, didn't they? But nowadays, I'm like, no, no, it's its own thing. It so is. I didn't have any con- that was the first Miliana Torini thing I ever heard. Mm-hmm. So I, and for a long time, it was the only thing that right. I'd heard. And I yeah. was just like, for me, like, that's what she did is Gollum's song. And so mm-hmm. I had no, like, I didn't have baggage with it. And it's... I, depending on my mood on any given day, I would rank it with Into the West. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yes. But yes. also Into the West is really good. You know, am I feeling bad or am I feeling good today? Which one is the... <laughs> and, and there are some other great vocal moments uh, throughout. We do get a quick uh, Liz Frazier reprise, uh, which mm-hmm. is maybe the good one good thing about the Lothorian Elves being back there. But uh, I think even more vivid, and again, you can sort of see the moment as a bit much is the when Sheila Chandra comes in on the Breath of Life sequence, I think it's called, uh, which mm-hmm. is where Arwen go- it ghostly like kisses uh, kisses Aragorn as he's laying there. And of course, it turns out to be the horse, but um, but 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 her whole vocals coming in, it's lovely. Uh, she's a very underrated artist. I, I encourage people to seek out her work. Sheila Chandra again is her name, and then I forget who's doing the vocals. It's not Renee Fleming. She's in the final one. Uh, no, it's Isabel Barak Darian. That thank you. You're you're the you're, you're the one. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. This is this is the end. Yeah. This is the big. Yeah. Shout big... out to an Armenian artist. Uh, I, I knew, I knew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, the, the so sweeping moments where it's sort of the stirring, you know, when the last year, the last march of the end scene. Well, like, that's oh. actually that's a boy soprano. That is Bendel oh, Maestro. Right. Yes, yes. I'm confusing but the two. But for You're the Evan Star sequence with. Um, Arwen and Aragorn, it's Isabel. Yes, that's right. That's right. That's correct. Yeah. And uh, that's really, really striking. Um, the fragility of the boy soprano over the ends marching. Oh, it's so it's whatever led up to that moment, which is we've already talked about that. It's that that march connects. It hits right, right where it should be. Yeah. It's so great. The destruction of Isengard. And this was, uh, that still holds up so it does. well. It really does. Yeah. Uh, you know, talking about how, like seeing this in the theater and everyone just losing their minds cheering when the, when the on fire end puts himself out <laughs> in the yeah. water, just beautiful, wonderful. Also though, I brought this up in the slack, but I think that I have a suspicion that, the loosing of the Eisen, uh, the undamming Release of the Eisen, the was was the inspiration behind the Mount Doom Rube Goldberg device. I think in you're of probably power. onto something there. You yeah. probably are because we can't. Nothing can happen in that show that isn't based on the Peter Jackson movies. God, this, the sheer difference between the two. Uh, you're right, of course. You're right, but dear Lord. If they'd been referencing it in something that, in a way that made sense, it'd be fine. But I feel like they're just like, oh, we need a river rushing through things because the two towers did it. Yeah, they did it. And everyone loved that. It's like, yes. yes. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, as always, the original color grading throughout the film looks very oh. lovely. OK, so this was a mistake that we made. We oh. were too lazy to put the Blu-ray in the <laughs> Blu-ray player. <laughs> so we streamed the theatrical version and it was the dog shit color grade Dough. that is it's beyond it's just appalling it's appalling i like mm. i still have a really hard time believing that peter jackson was yeah this is the this is how it's supposed to be because it looks horrific like it's so bad it's so bad it's just so desaturated and garbage yeah i mean the, the theater has released it was already pretty desaturated yeah to a degree but yeah i feel like there are probably moments that go Beyond, uh, too far. Yeah. <laughs> beyond. I was like, why is Frodo completely gray? Like, where are the pinks and the skin tone? Mm-hmm. Come on. 
You just like I mean. the, the vividness of the colors of the banners behind Theoden's throne. I always mm-hmm. like, you know, it's a very much, it, it, it helps, it helps lighten and change that feeling in the room there. And, uh, and uh, just, just other factors throughout. I mean, it's, just, it's so, so wonderfully well done. Yeah. Costuming back through the roof. Always. Uh, I mean, always always great. great. Nyla Dixon killed it. Yeah, just... I find it interesting that we all seem to be of the opinion that this movie is definitely the is by far the weakest link uh, mm-hmm. for for a number of reasons. But we're still talking about it really positively. Like we yeah. all have yeah. lots of positive yeah. things to say about it, and yet for, for the Rings of Power show, we just couldn't muster up the couldn't, same enthusiasm. Because there's still, even though this is not a good movie, there's still a level of love and care put into yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are so many good moments mm-hmm. that yeah. even though it's still not good, like I don't have now, I don't have an overall positive impression of it. Mm-hmm. There's still so much here that was done right. Mm-hmm. Whereas Rings of Power has maybe two things they did right. And it wasn't, it's clearly not made out of love. It's made out of capitalism. Whereas <laughs> Two Towers <laughs> is the reverse. Right, right. I mean, it would have been interesting in retrospect. I mean, I, it wouldn't have worked, I think, if uh, the original idea of making it a two, two film adaptation instead of a three, would that have solved the problem? I don't know. I don't think so. You'd have still have to come up with some sort of logical ending point to split the two split the things yeah. if they had gone that yeah. route. So I don't think it would necessarily have been a benefit. I'm glad to have three for many different reasons. Um, certainly a lot better than uh, when The Hobbit was turned into three films. <laughs> but um, mm. another time. What, uh, what but, Hobbit uh, films? <laughs> what are yeah. you talking about? Uh, yeah. I forget. Were those a thing? Um, but, uh, there were three but, Rankin Bass Hobbits? What? Yeah, yeah what? exactly. Um, but uh, no, no, the back sheet. Um, let's see. So, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, I, the, you're right. I mean, you know, it's one of those things. It's it's hard to say. The film is now experiential. Essentially, it is something that you see it in the sequence. It's really hard for it. It is right. clearly it is clearly not the Empire Strikes Back of the of the series yeah. of films. Right. To be fair, though, to be fair, of course, this is not an act, this is not an actual trilogy. It's one story. Yeah. So yeah. we always have to keep in mind. And they, you know, it should give everyone credit. Philippa Boyens is very very clear about this in her various comments and things you can see in the documentaries. It's sort of like, okay, what do we do with this middle bit? How do we make yeah. it stand out? And they made had to make choices. They had to make adaptation choices. They did what they could with the combination of elements of what they already filmed, the reaction that Fellowship had gotten, etc. But I'm not surprised that this is the film that uh, as compared to both Fellowship and then when they return, is the one with, say, the least Oscar nominations. It has mm-hmm. attention, but it doesn't have things. The one big obvious thing which we talked about is you know, again, absolutely no reason why Andy Serkis shouldn't have gotten some sort of nomination. It seems yeah, incredibly clear. That will always be the Lacunye, I think I think people were just couldn't get their heads around it, and it's only now that people are like, wait, it all kind of really started yeah. here to a strong degree. This is kind of where, you know, this is a ground zero for so much that's followed. But yeah, beyond that, I mean, it's one of those things that I don't think I'll ever do what I've done, and that is see it on its own again. For me, it'll no. have to be sort of like mm-hmm. take a full day and just take it all in and have it be part of the journey. That really is the best way to sort of fix and to experience it. And that's that's where I'll, I'll end uh, since we should probably probably wrap up. It's a good yeah. long episode, but it's, oh, deserved. Really... it's deserved. This yeah. is fully deserved. Um, what are your guys' final thoughts? So Oh gosh, I also yeah don't anticipate rewatching this not in the context of, mm-hmm. of the trilogy anytime soon. Mm-hmm. But you know, yeah, there's moments, and <laughs> that's nice. Yeah. I feel like I, I I said whatever my final thoughts would be probably would have been like what I just said a minute ago about it still being made with yeah. love, and it's yeah. still like there's a lot of there's a lot of good stuff to yeah, it. Yeah, d- everyone involved there's still should some still good be in proud this film, this. and it's worth fighting for. <laughs> and it's worth fighting for. <laughs> yeah. yeah, even among everything else, it's still yeah. All right, so it's time to look ahead to the next episode. That will be our first episode of 2023. Wow, it's coming along. So, uh, And it comes around again. And we find ourselves in a bit of a quandary, as we indicated in the news section, because there is a new Tolkien book out, and we would love to talk about it, but we can't talk about it quite yet, or at least not in good conscience, because we'll, of we'll the... We'll never cross a picket line. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and the thing is, again, this is also because it is a new book that is uh, that is coming out 
out, and the only way to mostly get it is, unless you want to get into whatever line may or may not be forming uh, for your library <laughs> copy of it, is you mostly have to pay full price. Although I'm sure discounted things, blah, blah. But the point is, you know, they have asked us, it's not even a question of purchasing. The union is asked to not give publicity to such things. We will not. Mm-hmm. However, there is an alternate approach. So here's what I'm going to say. I would say at this point, I encourage you to kind of do what they say and buy the book not from Amazon. We've given Amazon enough attention as it is this year, <laughs> you know, and uh, and get it from like a local bookstore and all that, and read it. And keep in mind, we will get to it sometime soon. And and I will add uh, that my take on it is is that if for some reason the strike is resolved, say in the next couple of weeks from now, or maybe even by the time this episode actually appears, great. That throws the doors open, and we will have our January episode be about the fall of Numenor. If it is not, if the strike continues on, if there's a delay by the time we get to it, whatever it might be. Then here's going to be my backup, because for the last couple of years, we've been doing the January episodes is where I've been trying to talk about things that are sort of non-Middle-Earth Tolkien. We've done, you know, Farmer Giles. We've done Smith, Wound, Major. We did Tree and Leaf last time. So what we do this time? This time around, we're sort of, we've gotten through the major, ironically, major minor works at this point. <laughs> so so I will cast the net broadly. So again, we may still do Fall of Numenor, but if we do not, if we are not conscious to it, we're going to take a slightly different take on things. And that is to look at, uh, to have a chance to talk about a couple of works that I don't think we would be able to really talk about on a full episode on their own, to be utterly honest. But we can place them in a context. And that context is this. I would like to think about and talk about Tolkien specifically as an author for children, as a children's mm-hmm. book author. Because, of course, for so many of us, you know, The Hobbit as, you know, his, you could say, his best kids book, for lack of a better term, which it, for a strong degree is, um, is, uh, is, uh, is the way in for a lot of people. And the fact remains that so many uh, that uh, when he himself had young kids, perhaps not unsurprisingly, is when he had a full range of things that were mostly not published at the time or were not published until much later um, that uh, were essentially all kinds of kids stories to a degree. This is the Father Christmas Letters. To a certain degree, um, this is uh, this is uh, t- there's all there are a couple of other things to mention again. I mentioned the Hobbit. The, however, the two things I'd like to talk about as an anchor to talking about this more broadly, so we can talk about almost whatever we want to, either in some of the other main books or things like that. And these are older books, so you can find them for cheap and or at your library much more easily. So that'll be our sort of gentle way around things. Um, <laughs> are to talk about uh, the two posthumous publications that came out. Uh, Rover Random mm-hmm. and Mr. Bliss, mm-hmm. both of which are short. Both of which are Rover Random is probably easier to find. That can be found in the anthology Tales from the Perilous Realm that Alan Lee did a bunch of illustrations for. There was, however, a separate edition published first that shows Tolkien's own drawings for it, which I encourage you to do. He fully <laughs> illustrated that. And Mr. Bliss is much simpler and much more basic, but it's also kind of fun. So that's our kind of back doorway around it. So again, keeping the union in mind, try and find library copies of that, <laughs> you know, or try and find it for like secondhand for like thrift books or something for like two bucks or something, things like this. Just keep it something low key and do that. So again, which one will we do? Lady in the Tiger situation, kind of. We're going to have to see what we get. So again, we will we'll make uh, announcements. And the other thing I would like to announce uh, that, uh, that uh, I think we're all well aware of is normally getting our outro with all our Twitter handles. But I think you've been knowing what's been going on lately. Now, we haven't made any final real decisions on this, either as a domain or as a thing. We haven't really had to talk about it. Um, I will say this. uh, The Buy the Bywater account is still up uh, for the moment because it's there. Uh, I, myself, am not going to be back on Twitter anytime soon, if at all. Everyone's going to be making their own individual decisions here. Um, Our outro will just be a uh, gentle song outro. We'll just do the musical theme as it is. (laughs) and. So enjoy some of uh, some of uh, Chris's music. Chris, of course, being our uh, podcast uh, host overall for the entire domain at Megaphonic, and uh, enjoy that this time. We will let you know if there's some sort of new permanent solution to how to find us all. But the main thing is always remember you can find the basic. Uh, the basic uh, show domain uh, megaphonic.fm slash by the biowater and if you're listening and you got to subscribe to your famous podcast service you'll hear us next time don't worry <laughs> but yeah. we'll be around but it will be uh, we will not record again until after the new year we're giving ourselves a break we're going to see how things go I hope I hope you two have your own good plans to either lay low during the holidays or have fun <laughs> or some combination thereof 
I don't know if you have any big plans or guess not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we're, I guess we're we'll just recuperating. We'll <laughs> yes, yes. We, we will see what happens. So with that uh, said, uh, thank you again very much for listening. Thank you again for listening to another calendar year's worth of uh, podcasts. Uh, we always appreciate it. Uh, we will come back to you in the new year with whatever we come back with. Um, we will see how it goes. <laughs> and until that time, we will talk to you. Enjoy the music. You have our contact info. As I mentioned earlier, we'll talk to you sometime soon. 